Good morning, this is Mr. Ketchersai with College of the Mainland Department of Nursing. We're going to be talking about the nervous system today, and today's lecture is specifically going to be on stroke and um, pain. So chapter 57 on 1330 starts our stroke chapter. Before we move on, um, we're still responsible for learning neurology assessments. So you have your neuro labs or your assessment labs that will be part of your work for this upcoming for exam three. Um, make sure you're reading that assessment chapter and going over those assessment labs or assessment slides that are in your slide deck for these for this um, lecture. I've taken them out of the slide presentation but they're still in your student packet for um, the slides I've given to you to review. Um, especially making sure that you know what those diagnostics are that we um, use um, for, for um, patients with uh, neurological problems. So a stroke, according to our book, really occurs when there is inadequate blood flow to part of the brain or hemorrhage, either one of these causing an interruption in perfusion, not getting the oxygen from the, the, the circulatory system into the, into the brain cells, and that those cells start to die uh, pretty quickly. You have a window of time um, that you can get things fixed. Um, outside of that, um, there is permanent damage that occurs. There's two types of stroke that we're going to talk about. One's the ischemic stroke, and one is hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke is when there's an inadequate blood flow, usually related to a clot or um, something of that nature probably coming from a deep vein thrombosis or from other areas of the um, body where you may have compromised blood flow like peripheral vascular disease or um, if you have atrial fibrillation in your upper two chambers of your heart uh, these, or if you have um, implanted heart valves. All of these things uh, contribute to the uh, formation of blood clots, um, which could, um, besides causing a you know deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism, the other major complication of blood clots is ischemic stroke. Hemorrhage is where um, something happens, a, a blood vessel bursts, or, or some other mechanism causing blood to hemorrhage directly into the brain, creating pressure. So you not only have the ischemic pressure, you have uh, death of the cells from the increased um, intracranial pressure. Um, we're starting to use the word brain attack. It's not really caught on in the general public, um, but we're trying to use that to get people to think of it as serious as they do a heart attack. If they see someone in the community that has signs and symptoms of stroke, they're going to treat it like a medical emergency, just like we would a heart attack. So a lot of your CPR classes now are also teaching um, stroke assessment as part of the uh, assessment to call for immediate help. So what what are some fast warning signs for stroke? Um, page 11, or 1331 of table 57.1 talks about face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties. Um, the big thing with time is that if it's an ischemic stroke, we only really have about three to four hours to get any benefit from the medication. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, which there's no way you're going to know this um, emergently until diagnostics are done. Um, but for hemorrhagic, that needs to be done almost instantly. So as soon as it's noted, um, this patient needs help. 
I did skip one slide. Um, the previous slide was on, showed the um, cerebral arteries in the circle of Willis, kind of where all these things are taking place. So it takes some time to study that. The outcome of strokes is that a person would have severity of, lo or of loss of brain function according to the location and extent of the brain damage. So how much uh, of the brain is cut off from circulation or damage to pressure, uh, those, those areas that the brain controls are going to have some sort of um, negative, negative impact um, in their ability to function physically, cognitively, emotionally. Stroke is the fifth most common cause of death in the United States, leading to serious long-term disability. About almost a million people have a stroke every year, either kind. Um, and for most of these people, or for a lot of them, not a, not a majority, um, and this number is decreasing as we become more competent in stroke care, um, there will be 15 to 30 percent with permanent disability. And this obviously has an impact on the way the client is able to t do their activities of daily living or the burden that it's going to place on the family um, or the community um, if this patient needs long-term care. Um, I know I got a call a couple of years ago. My father, um, who has all the risk factors, was in the emergency room um, with a hemorrhagic stroke. So naturally, you know, I'm starting to freak out. Um, but I talked to the nurse. When I found out about it, I was able to talk to him, and he seemed fine to me. Um, and I talked to the nurse, and she confirmed that the CAT scan showed a very small hemorrhagic stroke that they were going to be monitoring, um, but that his NIHH or NIHSS stroke scale was negative, meaning he did not have any uh, negative outcomes. There was no obvious disability um, at that point, no deficits. Um, when they did the um, repeat CAT scans later, there was no um, growth um, of that thing. So we were very lucky. Um, that he was able to have a positive outcome, particularly with um, the kind of stroke he had. You're going to find out as we move on with ischemic strokes, if you're able to treat them right away, that you have a very good chance of a good outcome. Um, the worst outcomes come with patients with hemorrhagic strokes. The best way to um, obviously fight strokes is um, through prevention and patient and client teaching for your patients with high risk factors. Um, these obviously, like anything else, can be divided into non-modifiable and modifiable. Um, the risk does increase you know, geometrically, when you have multiple risk factors going on at once. For non-modifiable, um, age, gender, ethnicity, heredity plays a big part of this. And then the modifiable, what are the things that we can do ourselves to prevent this? Probably one of the the biggest modifiable things is hypertension. This is a big risk for patients that have hypertension is having a stroke. So getting the blood pressure under control, if there's any other heart diseases going on, making sure those are better, improving or not worsening. Uh, diabetes, cholesterol, smoking, obesity, sleep apnea, metabolic syndrome, um, sedentary lifestyle, and drug use. Uh, TIA or transient ischemic attack. This is when a patient has a stroke-like event, 
um, that usually corrects itself within just a matter of minutes. Um, these symptoms usually last um, less than an hour. A transient episode, I mean, at first you're going to think it's a stroke. It's going to scare the, the patient or the family enough to call EMS or to come to the hospital on their own if they can't afford that. Um, but the, the, then the symptoms are gone immediately. Um, this does increase the risk of stroke going forward, though. So, um, these patients really have to monitor their those uh, modifiable risk factors. No way to really predict the outcome. A third do not have another event. A third will have more TIAs than a third. Uh, they will eventually have a stroke. As we said before, strokes are um, classified as ischemic or thrombotic or embolic or hemorrhagic, meaning there's a hemorrhage in the brain. And this shows um, how that works, which we've discussed. And we've talked about now, ischemic or thrombotic stroke will occur um, from injury to a blood vessel wall, which does form a clot. So if you remember the talk we were having in cardiovascular about plaque buildup, okay, this is what this is talking about, the plaque uh, tearing off uh, parts of the blood vessel wall and then starting to form a blood clot. Um, so what happens is that blood vessel will start to narrow and then the, the pressure gradient there difference is going to uh, pay, uh, put the patient at high risk for clot formation. Um, this is the most common cause of stroke, 60%, um, often related to hypertension or diabetes or both, and they may be preceded by a TIA. The extent of the stroke really depends on the rapid onset, the size of the damaged area, and the presence of collateral circulation. Embolic stroke occurs when embolus lodges and includes a cerebral artery, results in an infarction and edema of the area supplied by the blood vessel. This is the second most common cause of stroke. Embolic stroke, um, these have sudden onsets with clinical manifestations. Warning signs are less common. The patient's usually conscious, and they can have a recurrence. Hemorrhagic results in the bleeding of the brain itself, as we've talked about. Um, either subarachnoid or intracerebral. This, this is an example of a major bleed into the brain. These are caused also by hypertension. In the case of my father, it was because of his uncontrolled hypertension. Other causes, vascular malformation, coagulation disorders, anticoagulant drugs, trauma, brain tumors, ruptured aneurysms, extent of symptoms, one thing you really have to watch out for, for with this, for the prevention of, is your patients that are on anticoagulants. This is very important in the hospital because your hospital patients are at risk for fall. Um, and so if they're, if they're um, at risk for fall already, you see that they're on warfarin or some other um, anticoagulant, you've got to be very, very careful. Um, unless your hospital is a um, an advanced stroke center or a comprehensive stroke center, this patient may not be able to have brain surgery right away. Um, so it's very important. Time is of the essence. Manifestations include neurologic deficits, headaches, nausea, vomiting, Decreased levels of consciousness and hypertension. 
Um, headache is often misdiagnosed um, and not considered as possible um, symptom of stroke. Probably a lot of your stroke fallouts on your on patient on hospitals that are working towards stroke accreditation, probably half of their um, account fallouts are over strokes that were just wrote, written off as a headache. Um, and they eventually, you know, stroked out to a much greater degree. So if you, you know, end up in the ER, don't write off those headache patients. Um, pay attention to those and make those rule out stroke patients. Cerebral aneurysm is also the cause of hemorrhagic strokes. These can be a, si a silent killer. Uh, loss of consciousness may or may not occur. And there is a high mortality rate. The manifestations of right brain and left brain stroke, it's going to be really important for you um, to know these differences. So study this, especially figure 57.4, which is on... Page 1336. Most obvious effects of stroke are going to be around mobility, respiratory function, swallowing and speech, gag reflex, and self-care abilities. Characteristic motor function deficits, loss of skill, voluntary movement, or integration of movements, those fine motor skills, um, changes in muscle tone, and altered reflexes. They could go from an initial um, period of flaccidity that may last from days to several weeks, then moving into a, spa a spasticity of muscles um, later on. Um, this could cause aphasia, which could be receptive, expressive, or global. The inability to comprehend what you're saying or the inability to speak what they're thinking. Um, or global, the total inability to communicate at all. Dysphasia talks about um, an impaired ability to communicate um, Non-fluent means not a minimal speech activity with slow speech. Um, fluent dysphagia is where speech is present but has little meaningful information. Many patients may experience dysarthia, which is a problem with muscular control of speech. So the um, impairments may involve pronounce, pronunciation, articulation, or phonation deficits. Patients who have a stroke may have a hard time controlling their emotions. Um, emotional responses may be exaggerated or unpredictable. These can be magnified by depression, changes in body image, loss of function. They could have memory impairments spatial perceptual differences. It could make the patients incontinent, depending on, you know, how the, you know, the severity of each part of the brain. So how do we know a patient is going to, has had a stroke? So when you have a patient come in the ER with signs and symptoms of stroke, these patients are going to be immediately bedded. Um, the clock on getting them fixed starts the minute they walk in the door. So we have to make sure the patient has had a stroke and identify the likely cause. And so they're going to need usually a CAT scan um, first to distinguish whether they've had an ischemic stroke or not or hemorrhagic stroke or not. And if they've not, if this rules out hemorrhagic, um, and if they meet the qualifications, they will get the special medication um, for this, which we'll talk about later. 
Um, if it's worse, um, they'll do the MRI for more information. We're not going to talk about stenting or surgical intervention. At this time, really just acute care um, because then you're going to be saying, well, why are we talking about patients that present in the ER? Because you may have a patient that strokes out in the doctor's office if you're working in a primary care setting or on a med surge floor. So we do a basic neurological assessment. Signs of increasing neurological deficits, um, knowing that most patients can worsen in the first day or two. Elevated blood pressure is the most common immediately after stroke, and we'll actually have to get that down to do treatments. Control fluid and electrolyte balance manage inter, uh, ICP, the intracranial pressure, if we're concerned about hemorrhagic stroke. So what the, med the medication that we give patients is recombinant tissue plasmogenogen activator, TPA. This is given to us reestablish blood flow. It's basically a declutter um, that moves through the blocked artery to prevent cell death. Now you have a window of opportunity to give this uh, three to four and a half hours um, from the onset of clinical signs of ischemic stroke. And in the hospital setting, this is frequently called the last known well, or LKW. Um, so if you saw Grandpa fall at 3 o'clock and you're in the emergency room with him at 5.30, your last known well was two and a half hours ago. If we saw Grandpa go to bed at 11 p.m. and didn't notice... Uh, the signs and symptoms until he wasn't responding and we tried to get him up at 6 a.m. and he's has you know mega impaired deficits well that last known well is still 11 o'clock so he's outside of that window of opportunity um, to get treatment and you might think well why wouldn't we do it anyway because if we wake him up and he ha has these deficits you know it might have been around after 11 when he had the stroke, it could have been 30 minutes ago. We don't know. Um, TPA is, a again, a big clot buster, and it can cause hemorrhagic issues. So the, the thing there is, is this is a very high-risk medication. Um, and in that first three to four hours, the benefits far outweigh the risks. After that four and a half hours, there's really not much benefit. So you're just putting the patient at very extreme risk um, for having complications of the medication itself with little to no benefit at all um, for the medication to help with the stroke. Once the patient's been stabilized, um, we put the patient on anticoagulants and platelet inhibitors. Use of statins is also effective after an ischemic stroke. Goals, we're supposed to manage airway, breathing, circulation, intracranial pressure. And we're not going to talk about surgical intervention. This is what you, this, a hemorrhagic stroke, if the patient's symptomatic, they've got to go to surgery. So just Memorize your um, stroke signs and symptoms. Know your last known well, because these are questions you're going to have to ask if your patient is in a non-emergent setting, like uh, bedside. Um, if you're on the med surge floor and your patient suddenly stops speaking, um, you need to know exactly what to do. And then they'll get rehabilitation afterwards, depending on what all the deficits need to be um, worked on. This uh, slide here has a typo. Uh, it's 57.9 in the textbook on page 1342. Core measures for stroke. These things that these are um, items that are covered 
um, for you to make sure that you're providing standardized care for patients that come in with uh, VTE, um, I'm sorry, with hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. It's mostly geared toward uh, the ischemic stroke patient, um, what they get done immediately, and then how they're followed up with um, for continuing medication therapy and the education they get when they're discharged. So in 1342, uh, table 57.9, you can see the stroke core measure set. This was developed in partnership with the American Stroke Association to be used for primary stroke centers. And a lot of your neighborhood um, hospitals now are certified as um, primary stroke centers. And it really it means that you're able to give that, um, that you're measuring your stroke patients to make sure they're getting all the care that they need and that that TPA is given within the guidelines um, to have the best outcomes. Um, and so for the most part, the other thing these, these facilities have to have is a dedicated stroke unit. Uh, usually this is a step-down unit, or it could be its own step-down unit. Sometimes it's combined with the IMCU um, to do both. And those nurses are trained in uh, neurological assessments, the NIH stroke scale, um, to make sure they can monitor these patients actively to make sure the symptoms aren't worsening or they're not continuing to have strokes. The other type of stroke center is the comprehensive stroke center, which is where they would have surgery. Um, they're equipped 24 hours a day um, with surgeons available and in-house to uh, do uh, brain surgery on the event that someone has a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, a lot of these core measures have stopped being mandatory on just any acute care floor, but uh, stroke any hospital that's a primary stroke center still measures these. It's part of their ongoing certification to make sure they measure each each um, element of the care, starting from the time they walked into the door to the time they got their CAT scan to the time the CAT scan was uh, read to the doctor till the time the um, TPA was given. There's all these marks. This can... You know, there shouldn't be more than 15 minutes between this and that and so forth. And uh, th those hospitals, you know, to keep that certification, they've got to show that they're monitoring this every month and that they're keeping um, those outcomes within guidelines. Um, and if they fall out, if there's if those times are longer than they need to be, then they're, they're working on action plans um, to get those things remedied. Nursing assessments, um, let's see. Besides a comprehensive neuro exam, um, the NIH stroke scale is, this, is that specialty stroke scale I was talking about. It's not something that all nurses have to learn, but you will have to learn this if you work in an emergency room environment if you're working in ICU or if you're working on those stroke units. This will be part of your training um, to make sure you can uh, monitor uh, patients that are post-stroke and unstable. We talk a little bit more about the assessment in today's health assessment lab. Um, You just go through, make sure I'm not missing anything. I've got to get to the next part of our lecture. Make, sh make sure you read through all of these slides um, and make to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, I am I'm, I am covering the highlights of the most important things that we have to to know going forward.
So um, the one thing about stroke, for us, for common, it's really that we need, we understand the initial signs and the things that we initially do to get the patient um, where they need to be because a lot of times this will have to happen where the patient is at, whether they're in the mer whether they're in the emergency room or whether um, you've noticed this at the bedside um, as, as a med surgeon nurse, these symptoms. Um, you've got to know what your policy is on calling a code stroke or whatever. Um, the management after we started this, this is really going to be taught in complex next semester um, and then enhanced, so you're going to get a lot of this over again, but we're doing the introduction to stroke this semester. So we're going to talk about pain now. What is pain? Pain is really um, what the patient says it is, right? It's one of those very subjective uh, things. And for the most part in the last 10, 20 years, um, it's been completely subjective. We've really not um, put a lot of objectivity into it. And now we're learning that some of this may have actually contributed to the opioid crisis that's going on in the United States. So now there's an attempt to be more objective um, and to make sure we're doing things right to not only treat the patient's pain uh, appropriately, but to make sure we're not doing more harm than good. 25 million pain experience acute pain from injury or surgery. Chronic pain affects over a million adults a year. And 60% of cancer patients will experience this during their treatment. And the slide here talking about the magnitude of the problem. Traditionally, hospitals have under-treated pain. We've written off uh, patients complaining of pain as seekers or drug addicts. And, you know, uh, YouTube is probably full of examples of a uh, patient's family with cameras on, um, you know, seeing their family, their loved one, not being treated for pain. Um, so last 10, 20 years, we tried to really up the efforts. We called it the fifth vital sign. Um, we took them at their word and medicated them at their um as prescribed based on how well they did on their uh, 0 to 10 pain scale. Um, but now we're kind of trying to be a little more sophisticated uh, so that we're managing this correctly, managing the cost, and not creating dependence. Consequences of untreated pain and necessary suffering. Physical, psychological dysfunction, immunosuppression, sleep disturbances. Uh, one example that I remember of untreated pain, uh, an example of, you know, that still exists in hospitals, the, you know, treating all pain requests as drug um, requests, treating you as the drug dealer. There was a patient in one of our hospitals that we did clinicals at where the doctor did not order any medication at all pre-wound care. So this patient was having... Debreed, debreeding type wound care every day, wet to dry, uh, and where you're having to pull a dry dressing out to debreed um, the wound. A large, a very large wound. The doctor had nothing, not even a pill ordered. Um, and then when the nurse called the doctor, I suggested to the student that maybe we need to call the doctor. So the nurse called the doctor and he basically chewed him out and said, you know, this this is the patient's circumstance. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to fall into their trap or something. And the nurse, it took really the nurse chewing the doctor out and threatening to go over his head. You know, her not wanting to give him something routinely, but to give him something, you know, 30 minutes before his wound care so that it's not hurting him as much. And I'm sorry, uh, I don't care what your situation in life is, an open wound with uh, debreeding wound care, wet to dry. This is that that's inhumane torture to do that without uh, pre medication.
pain can make us angry. It can make us more fearful, depression, anxiety. We always you know, get to that um, between moderate and severe when we're kind of in that place where um, we're not functional or we're not enjoying what's going on. We can't watch TV. We can't eat. We can't read. Um, we're, and then going into severe pain where it's causing us to cry out and um, uh, really, really um, experience all those negative side effects. Observable actions, grimacing, irritability, coping skills, agitation, combativeness. Go through all of these and, and know what they are, know what nociception is, and the processes there, the mechanisms of pain perception. Um, one thing I do want to say before we, I move forward in the slides, you guys have been nurses for some time, and as many ex ex examples as we give about patients that were not medicated properly, we all probably have um, stories of our own where people have come in and basically tried to use us as their drug dealer. Um, so how do, how do you know what the difference is? How do you um, treat that patient effectively and, and not do them harm? And, and what I try to do is always give the patient the benefit of the doubt. If they say they're in pain, I believe they're in pain. I treat them by what the doctor ordered. Now, having said that, if I see complaints of pain without these signs and symptoms of pain, then I make sure I'm communicating with the physician either by direct call or leaving him a note in the nurse's notes, you know, saying, patient states this is the worst pain they've ever had in their life. It's an 11 on the 10 scale. Um, but basically, when you walked in the room, you interrupted them on the, having a phone call with their sister laughing about something they saw on TV. Well, I'm sorry, patients with an 11 do not laugh with their sister on the telephone. Um, so that's an abnormal behavior um, for someone with a high level of pain. So, if, of course, at that moment, you know, I would honor the patient's request, but then I would... I would do a focused assessment explaining what I saw when I went in um, and to request the physician to reevaluate their treatment. And, and a lot of doctors will love you for giving them this information. Um, they're, they're very happy to discontinue those pain medications when they do have um, uh, somebody that's seeking pain. And what's really sad is when you see patients that have really horrible chronic conditions. They truly do suffer from pain a lot, but they also have a, a, an addiction to, to pain medication. Um, I remember, you know, one of the most horrible diseases a person can have, one of the most painful diseases someone can have is sickle cell anemia. And when they're in crisis, you know, sometimes they have to be hospitalized. And I'll always remember this pediatric patient who did suffer. He had frequent... Um, um, crises and he um, wasn't very compliant with his medication and his treatment to, to reduce those complications. But when he was hurting, he was hurting. But sometimes he just wanted to buzz. And so I can remember him saying he was, he was crying and it was the worst pain he's ever had. And he, he was just uh, in a fit. And if we didn't do something, he was going to call his parents to come chew us out or something and so I'm you know getting his pain medication is ordered and I walk in the room and he's bouncing on the bed this is like a 12 year old kid pretty tall kid already bouncing on the hospital bed and as soon as I walked in the door he kicks his legs out and flips out on the bed and starts groaning in pain pretending that I didn't see the jumping before that's probably the one of the worst cases I've personally seen um, but believe me, the doctor was aware of that um, before I left the hospital that day. Um, let's see. One thing you need to know, uh, 
you know, it's important for us to know the patho and all of this. I'm not going to say don't focus on the patho. But one thing you really do need to focus on for the test is um, how, how do we treat, how can we treat pain? What are some of the non-pharmacological approaches to pain treatment um, versus pharmacological? And what are the different pharmaco pharmacological? What do we use for mild to moderate? Usually NSAIDs. Um, and then we save our uh, narcotic um, stuff for the patients that are I mean, you know, very severe pain. Just looking for something to see if um, I don't want to miss something that might be on a test. Know the difference between acute and chronic pain. Know the definition between acute and chronic pain. Pain assessments. Probably the one. Probably the one we use most often historically has been the 0 to 10 scale. But there's a new one called the QR, gosh, I'm going to say it wrong, QRST or something like that. And we do talk a little bit about that in our health assessment lab later on today. Um, it's supposed to be a little more sophisticated um, than this. And then uh, Ms. Gunderman is going to talk to you in her recorded lecture today about the medications um, that we can use for these different types of pain. I'm going to go ahead and cut the slides. Um, I've covered most of what I want to talk about with pain. Um, so just make sure you read through these. Focus on the things I've talked about. Um, and we should be good for the test. Um, do remember, though, the other part of this lecture is health assessment. So you need to understand that chapter. And you also need to understand the pharmacology, which Ms. Gunderman is going to go over today. Okay, guys, talk to you later.